Thanks, Sabinia. Uh, this panel has got a poetic name, actually. It's called Asteroids and Ancient Beauty. It's really about the, the science of asteroids and comets. And uh, I want to start with you, Patrick. Uh, what do asteroids tell us about the, the formation of the solar system, the history of the solar system? Oh, they tell us a lot because, in, in fact, so we have to remember that the solar system formed initially from the star the Sun, which was surrounded by a disk of dust and gas. And uh, in this uh, disk of dust and gas, the dust started to accumulate and grow planets. This was 4.567 billion years ago. And the reason why, by the way, we know the date is thanks to some uh, elements in meteorites, which are called calcium aluminum rich inclusions, which are the oldest material that we know and which set the time t equals zero of the solar system. And these meteorites come from asteroids. And then once we started to grow planets, there were still a lot of materials that were there and uh, there were the leftover of planetary formation. And most of them were between Mars and Jupiter. And this, they are now the, the, the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And therefore, these uh, remnants of the bricks that form planets are as, uh, essentially the same composition of the, of the planet, but they contain the record of the original composition of the planet. Because obviously, after the planet formed, they started to cook like when you put eggs in an, o in a, in a, in a, you know, on an oven and then uh, you make an omelette. So basically the planet are now the omelette and we want to go to the eggs that form the planet and these are the asteroids. Uh, Naomi, what do we know about the, the surface of these, sort of, I suppose, ancient building blocks of the solar system? Yeah, they're incredible. Uh, every time we go uh, with an asteroid mission and we find a new asteroid to look at up close, we're absolutely overwhelmed by what we find. Each time it's a surprise. So, for example, when we were going to the asteroid Eros, we found these objects that were just, uh, it was just a beautiful object, almost like a banana shape, covered with this fine granular material all over it. And this granular material actually moves in ways that you wouldn't ever expect it to move because of the low gravity environment. Um, and then we have the surfaces of Itakawa, another asteroid that was visited um, by the Hayabusa mission. This one is just covered in big blocks and small blocks and small grains all over the surface. And these blocks actually move around. So it's a very dynamic environment. It's fascinating. So fascinating why the diversity there? These are all so bits yeah. of the early solar system, as it were. So why are they so different Absolutely, to each other? Absolutely, because they've gone through different evolutionary processes depending on their size. So you have lots of things happening. You have impacts between asteroids that are creating uh, regolith on the surface, this granular material on the surface as we're, we're creating the powder, we're breaking things down. Um, we have other asteroids that have experienced such a huge impact that they've actually completely disintegrated and then come back together again under the gravitational attraction uh, between the different blocks. And so they all look slightly different depending on what processes they've experienced in their history. And uh, Alan, um, th there's, I suppose this is asteroid day, but it could be asteroid and comet day, I suppose, in a sense. So could you just... Uh, define the difference or speak of the difference between asteroids and comets? Sure, well, what we know is that when we look out at the, all these little bodies orbiting the sun, some objects much smaller than normal planets and even most moons, we can quite often split them into two general groups. We have the asteroids, which as we now know are rocky, kind of solid or semi-solid surfaces. And then we have the comets, which are mostly composed of ice. And, and the same kind of ice, water ice, that you'd find in your freezer, or maybe your gin and tonic. Um, and that's the historical difference between them. But now we know that there's a, a, a continuum or a, a spread throughout the, the solar system. And so, for example, we have a new class of objects out there orbiting between Mars and Jupiter that we call main belt comets. So first, at a first glance, we would think that these are normal asteroids. But it turns out that every once in a while, maybe once per orbit, we see them exhibit cometary materials, they grow tails. And so we know there that these are possibly asteroids, but with a subsurface ice layer that has been exposed by the impact of another asteroid uh, on them. And, and therefore we get ice being released and water being released from that crater. So we do have this, this spread of di or this diversity of material throughout the asteroid belt and out elsewhere in the solar system, ranging from very solid, rocky asteroids to very icy objects such as normal comets. 
Now, Susan, you, you were um, involved very heavily in the Philae Lander, would you, for, yes, for the Irish in representative? Yes, and on. also, of course, in Giotto before that. So yes. one came after the other in a natural way. So how have those, those intercept missions and then the landing on the comet uh, changed public perception or inform the public about what these objects are? Well, we started in a very uninformed way because just the comets looked like streaks in the sky and they didn't reveal very much of their personality. But the first time really that we got to look at the nucleus of a comet was with the Giotto mission. And that one flew past uh, Comet Halley and for the first time we were able to see this nucleus was quite small. It was about 15 kilometers in length and then uh, it was uh, vaguely like a peanut. It was that sort of shape. It, some of it was active, some of it was quiescent and then uh, also, the surface was very dark with some surface features. Now, when we went on to Rosetta, most of the viewers will have already seen the wonderful pictures that we got of uh, Cheryum of Garashimenko, we'll call it 67P. And this one had cliffs and scarps and it had potholes, it had it cracks, all kinds of wonders. And in fact, it was very difficult to land on it because it was so diverse. So we began to change the perception that a comet was not so much a dirty snowball as was uh, the wisdom that came out at the time of Giotto, but that this was an extremely complex geological entity and lots of processes were going on there. Uh, we even were able to detect seasons on 67P and all of these changes and diversities were superimposed on being an archival sort of a distant object coming from very far away. It's, it's always the case in space exploration, isn't it? Your preconceptions are just completely demolished whenever you go to and anywhere. You go on and you have a wonderful <laughs> new insight. <laughs> yeah. G Julia, I wanted to ask you about, this. we've spoken a little bit about understanding the, the, the composition of asteroids and comets from a scientific perspective, but from a deflection perspective, why is that important? Well, I would say that uh, it's, um, it's really important to know the composition of an asteroid to really understand what are they made of if they are going to impact the Earth, not only from the point of view of the damage that an asteroid will cause, because it's completely different to have a monolithic piece of metal and a solid rock impacting the Earth than having a rubble pile of lighter material like carbonaceous material or something like that, that small pieces that are uh, stick together just by the force of gravity. So not only from um, estimating the damage, but also the strategies to, to how to deflect uh, such an impact or how to mitigate the, the, the impact. Does that mean that given, let's say we have to deflect one at some point in the future, does it make it very difficult to design a general purpose mission in that case, because these objects are so different that you've got to have, a, would you have to have several missions prepared, you know, depending on the composition of the object that was going to hit us? Well, that's, uh, you could think that way, but in fact, what I would say that, uh, uh, well, first you have to try once. Then, if you, if you try once and it succeeds, despite all the assumption that you, did, you, you, you used, then you are confident that uh, it should work anyway, because uh, you will always have assumptions. Uh, and uh, if the first time, it, either you were really lucky and you should buy a lot of ticket, or it means that your technology is robust. So it's not depending too much on the assumptions you made. Mm -hmm. And this is why, why, what we try with ver to verify with the IDA mission. So I think that once we have a technique which is verified, and once we have the numerical models validated with these techniques, like if you do an impact on an asteroid and you can validate the numerical models, then the numerical models can be used for any other sort of composition yeah. and verify what kind of energy you need. We've only got about a minute left, but I just wanted to ask you if anybody wants to answer. That we, we've spoken about what we know about the formation of the solar system and, and asteroids and comets. What, what are the, if there's one big question we might answer with continued study of asteroids, what, what might it be? Well, I, th I think one thing that astronomers really are trying to understand at the moment is important uh, for understanding the origin of life in that we know there's water in our solar system. We live on a planet that 
although it seems wet to us, it's actually incredibly dry. Only a fraction of a percent of the Earth is formed from water. But if we look at the asteroids throughout the asteroid belt, we can see signs of the action of water all the way through. And understanding what, what the history was of water in that region beyond the Earth can give us, I think, really big clues as to how the water arrived on our planet today. We've already heard from Susan about the Rosetta mission. That, of course, that has given us tremendous clues about that as well. But also, Julia, um, yes, organics. Yes, the water was different from the, mm -hmm. also, from the Earth. Also, organics present, which is surprising. Yes, we have, uh, well, in the meteorites that we are lucky enough to, to study them in the laboratory, we know that they contain organic material and they contain water and they contain minerals that have been altered by the presence of liquid water during millions of years. So those are the ingredients to create life. Yeah. Is it th th I think we also would say that the comets and maybe the asteroids too have seeded the early Earth with ingredients that have built up into prebiotic molecules and then probably gone on to, for the emergence of life. I know you, 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 it's a fascinating topic you've opened up just as they said that's the end of the... <laughs> 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 However, I think we'll come back to that later on in the day because it is fascinating, but thank you for now. And back to Sabinia. Thank you, Brian. And as we mentioned earlier, Astro Day Live is a global event. We have around 1,000 independent events being held around the globe in 20 or so countries and five continents. And with that, I want to hand over to Astro Day in Morocco, where three events are being organized in Casablanca, Marrakesh, and Agadir. And with that, I'd like to say welcome, Sakaria Belhai. Hi. In Turkey. Turkey. Tur oh, we wish you all, we wish, yeah, Turkey. But I think we have a sign here. We wish you all a life that is full of asteroid impacts, but hopefully smaller than one meter in size. Happy Asteroid Day 2017 from Turkey. Thank Hello. you very much, Turkey. Okay. Okay, um, uh, our events, I can, I can say, um, one observatory in Istanbul, there will be an observation. Um, okay at about 8 p.m. And here in Izmir, uh, we will get together with more people, actually, than you, than you see here. Um, Aegean Asteroid Day Tea Party and Astra Talks we are going to uh, organize. Also, local news and pay, uh, press will also participate at about uh, 8.45 p.m. again. And actually, here in Turkey, we all, already track meteors uh, for three years by a national uh, project. project. And uh, Turkey will cover whole, all the sky uh, of, of Turkey. Actually, the most important uh, thing that I'm going to tell now is that we were hit by a meteor in 2015, two years earlier. It is directly from Fort Vesta, as you see uh, behind me. Actually, it is um, under review uh, for a high-impact journal. Uh, we were hit by a hoverdite type, uh, a hoverdite type meteorite. Meteor actually, and it will be published, and surprising results are on the way, I guess, uh, with uh, 79 scientists all around the world. So stay tuned for surprising results from this beautiful asteroid. Thank you for sharing that story, and it was my mistake. Morocco isn't with us, um, at least not for now, and that was, of course, Turkey. So thank you, Turkey, for that support. And with that, I think it's time to head over to the Science Center and see what Natalie Reuters has up her sleeve. Natalie, are you there? Yes. Yeah, I'm there. Welcome back to the Science Center. And we are this time in front of the Spandex Space Time. What does this represent? Well, this is sort of a model of, of space and time because, as you know, in, the, in Einstein's theory of rel relativity, general relativity, uh, space is considered as a flexible entity. And this is what we represent here with a two-dimensional uh, sheet of uh, spandex. We have set a large uh, steel mass in the, in the center, which is supposed to represent the sun, say. And I have here in my right hand a mass, a smaller mass. Say this is um, just a body uh, floating around in the, in the solar system. If we leave it like this, it gets pulled by the central mass and it sort of represents gravity. 
if uh, we, we launch this object with a ten tangential speed, well, then we, we end up with, a, with an orbit, say a circular orbit, like just like planets. So it's actually a, a good model for the formation of planets? It's a good model for the solar system, for its motion, and for its formation, right. Um, I have here uh, steel rings in my hands, and um, say this is a um, tiny asteroid in the primitive solar system. The current theory of the formation of the solar system goes that, because as follows, so all this dust and small rocky uh, bodies accreted via gravity, and formed larger larger objects. And here, if you take a good look at this system, you will see collisions, but you will also see some rings um, sticking together. Let's, let's have a look. But uh, the uh, asteroid belt should also have uh, formed a planet, but it still exists. Uh, yeah, there, ah. there, a, pl a planet just formed, a planet just formed, sorry. Yeah, in the asteroid belt, we should expect the same phenomenon, right? Uh, accretion and uh, larger objects, larger objects growing. And this is something we don't observe um, at this moment. And the main reason for this is that there's Jupiter nearby, and Jupiter is uh, per perturbating the, the trajectories of the asteroids and making them more chaotic, as we've seen before with the chaotic pendulums. And you have prepared something else for us to finish off? our presentation here of the spandex space-time. A few marbles, again, to represent uh, uh, formation of planets and, and bodies by accretion. Let's have a look. And that's it from our side here from the Science Center. Back to you at the studio. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you for sharing all these cool experiments and demonstrations. I don't know if you've heard of the Rice Crater that was created about 15 million years ago due to an asteroid strike. Well, we're now going to go to Asteroid Day in Germany because Gisela Poges and also the Rice Crater Museum, they know a lot about this. Are you there, Gisela? Yeah, I'm here. Great. How's Great to meet you. The I'm same. just calling from the Rees Crater Museum. It's located in uh, the Rees Crater itself, a huge crater which was um, created by an asteroid strike 15 million years ago. And our museum focuses on the Rees impact, but also on the impact cratering processes in common and the danger from space. And here you have the opportunity to get all the theoretical basement information about impact cratering processes. And you can immediately go to the field and uh, see all the nice quarries and um, outcrops that show the uh, traces from the uh, catastrophe, like the astronauts did in 1970 when they trained here for the mission to Moon. And our museum got a very nice uh, lunar sample. It's from Apollo 16, and uh, it's comparable to our Sui White. This is the most typical rock here. And in 1960, uh, astronaut um, and uh, Shoemaker and Chow discovered that the Rees crater is an impact crater by high pressure modifications, of course, and several other impact minerals. And we are very proud to have this um, lunar sample on display and show the people that the lunar surface is covered by impact craters. And um, so we'd love to have, when we have maybe in, in several years, astronauts on the Mars that they trained in our crater, that we would invite them and we will happy to be uh, here as, uh, as hospitality here in Greece. Thank you very much, Gisela, and thank you very much to Astro Day in Germany for your support and, and for also sharing that information. So what's happening with asteroids currently? I think it's time to go over to John Luca. Yes, we are still looking up. We are still trying to search for new near-Earth asteroids. So we are back again with astronomer Rose Matney, part of the Catalina Sky Survey team. So, Rose, is there any news up there? Did you find something interesting for us? Oh, definitely. In the last hour that we spoke, um, or since the last hour we spoke, I found two new objects that I um, reported and that are now posted on the NEOCP page, so everyone can go and take a look at them. That uh, makes a total of eight objects that I found tonight, and that adds to the 10 that I found last night. So it's been a very productive run. Yes, I see you have a lot of uh, objects in the NEO confirmation page, so I see that you are doing a great job. So <laughs> I also understand you are just going to end the night right now. Correct. I just, uh, the sun's about to rise. I just shut down about 30 minutes ago, 
closed up the dome, archived, um, sent out my report, and uh, preparing the telescope for the next observer because I'm actually done for the, for the night and for the run. So uh, we still have work to do. So I really want to thank you for staying with us, no matter the long night for you. And we feel safer thanks to you. So keep looking up for us. And thank you again for joining us today live. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for having us.